you so much for um, allowing me to be with y'all tonight. Hey, everybody. Uh, we are so excited to be bringing this program to you on tonight. This is Run Girl Run. And why are we excited about Running Girl Run? Because we know that anytime you put Black women into the occasion, you have uh, the most dedicated, educated, articulate, hardest working people in the world on your side because Black women know how to make things happen. And for too long, we have been the butcher, the baker, and the candlestick maker. And we allow other people to ascend even beyond us with us doing all the work in the background. But now, with everything going on in this nation, it is salient and important for Black women to actually be the ones who are running for office and winning these seats. Because when we run, we win. And when we win, we change things for the better of the entire community. So on behalf of the Stone Mountain Lithonia Alumni Chapter and the Decatur Alumni Chapter, we're bringing you a great panel of people tonight that is going to get you inspired and ready to run. We know that Georgia is ready. It is ready for all types of exciting things now because we saw what happened in January of 2021 when we elected, you know, brand new people to represent us in uh, the United States Senate. And so now we need that same type of energy to be around Black women as Black women continue to run for even larger offices than the ones they currently have now. So I have the pleasure now of introducing someone who is dear to me. And uh, I'm just so excited to bring you all uh, LaDawn Blackie Jones. So let me tell you a little bit about her. Uh, she is um, born in uh, Houston, but raised in Atlanta. She studied at Tennessee State University and went to Tulane for law school. In 2012, uh, LBJ, that's what we call her, LBJ, she sought public office and won a seat in the Georgia General Assembly, and she represented Georgia in House District 62, which includes uh, East Point, College Park, Atlanta, and Douglas County for four years. During that time, she was on the Judiciary Committee, Budget, and Fiscal Oversight, and Small Business. Uh, Representative Jones was an active and vocal member of the General Assembly, and trust me, I know, because I served right beside her. Uh, many of you have heard about uh, people wanted to take down the monuments in Stone Mountain, and she was one of the people who was on it from the very beginning. He even tried to get us to uh, address it in the Georgia General Assembly, but many people were afraid. But with Black leadership, Black women know how to say what needs to be said, and don't worry about uh, repercussions if you're doing what's right and just. So after leaving the Georgia General Assembly, uh, LaDawn was selected as the first city solicitor for the city of South Fulton. Um, at that time, she began her third book. Did y'all hear me? I didn't say one, two. I said her third book, The Institution of Marriage, and it is a uh, fiction novel. She has been honored uh, with Atlanta Business Chronicles Top 40 Under 40 in 2018 and Atlanta's Black 40 Under 40 in 2019. Uh, she was also chosen as a Georgia lawyer of prestige um, and she began political coach with her business partner, Maisha Good, and they have it going on. So political coach has trained dozens of successful candidates in local, state, and federal elections. Um, during the time Bernie Sanders ran um, in 2016, she was the state director for him, um, making things happen in the state of Georgia. After working um, as an assistant DA for six years, she set out to open her own boutique law firm. And so if you haven't seen it, you need to go down to Auburn Avenue. She has it really, really nice. And you can, I think you can still buy memberships, but I'm sure she'll tell you how that whole thing works um, because she's trying to bring um, a new twist to Auburn Avenue. And we appreciate her for that. She is married to U.S. Army Sergeant Nathaniel Jones, and they have the most beautiful children. Um, Lyndon and Brendan. And so that is all I can say about LaDawn. Well, actually, I can say a lot about her, but that's all I'm going to say so that she can get the ball running and do what she needs to do because she can make it happen. Okay, LaDawn, I'm passing it over to you, darling. Thank you very much, Dee. I really appreciate that introduction. Welcome. Good evening, ladies. I'm glad that you all are here. Nobody was blown away by any tornadoes. I am excited about this evening because I am passionate about ensuring that people know 
how to run for office. Uh, I hear someone saying that you're having a hard time hearing me. Let me make sure my headphones are on the right way. Can it, if you can hear me, can you give me a thumbs up and let me know that you can hear me well? Great, awesome, awesome. I'll speak up a little bit more. Um, but it is so exciting uh, to be here at this opportunity to really make sure that we have a pipeline of smart, educated, well-prepared people to run for offices. If you felt like I did uh, after this last election, when you saw those numbers come out, when we knew that um, there was uh, Black women behind changing the entire face of the capital of the United States, it just made me beyond excited. So now that we got that fire going, it's time to make sure that we have everyone, have a pipeline of other people that know what it takes to run for office. And so what you're gonna hear from tonight, and I'm gonna introduce the speakers that we have here today. Um, what you're gonna hear tonight is probably gonna be summarized very simply. There's a difference between being a politician and running for office, right? And there's a science for running for office. There are certain ingredients and things that each one of us can do to prepare before we run and things we can do as we are running to ensure that we can win the race. And the other thing that I want to point out before I introduce the speakers, you know, one of the questions that we get quite often in Politicoach is, you know, my name is LaDawn with that 1980s capital D or maybe Tamika, right? Should I change my name? Should I shorten it? Should I use my initials? Well, I got good news for you. Based on that last election, you can run and be who you authentically are, particular, particularly here in the Atlanta metro area, right? Because that got you a chance, a higher chance of winning than it does a less chance of winning where we are. And that's such a beautiful thing to be a part of um, this part of the campaign season and the political world as we are. So we have some great speakers here tonight. I'm gonna to tell you a little bit about the Run the Show before we actually bring our first speakers on. Uh, first, we're gonna give you an overview of the 2020 election cycle, just so that you can kind of see how we got here. We're gonna talk a little bit about the upcoming positions that are available. Because if you're gonna run, you have to know what you're going to run for, right? How do you get prepared? And we're gonna talk about some of the organizational support and the importance of donating to campaigns. Because if you want good people in office, have to make sure they have the resources to get there. And then we're going to have an excellent speaker who helped me on my campaign talk a little bit about if you're thinking about running for office, what should you do? How do you even get started to get in that field? And then we're going to talk a little bit about a major call to action and discuss um, the DDNC. Um, and then we'll take some questions um, and answers at the end for all of the presentations and give you all your charge. And then also, it's a little hint. We got some prizes for you. We have some, some uh, door prizes. So you want to make sure you're paying attention to the questions and to the speakers because you might walk out with something that's really great. So um, our first speaker that I'm going to introduce is Ms. Rhonda F. Briggins, J.D. Rhonda Briggins is an active member of the Decatur Alumni Chapter and is currently serving as the co-chair of the National Social Action Commission of Delta Sigma Theta Sorority Incorporated. Ms. Briggins has managed many Delta campaigns for candidates seeking positions on the national, regional, and chapter le level, which includes speech writing, themes, platform creation, very important, booth design, volunteers, material design. She has successfully led many of those candidates to victory and inspired many others to run. She's been featured, check this out, in Glamour Magazine, Time Online Magazine, and several other publications for her national and local political work, training women to run for elected office. Rhonda is a mother of a talented 13-year-old son, Ty Ali, and a graduate of Georgia State University with a BS in Law and Society, and she's also earned her JD from Jones School of Law. She is a recipient of many distinguished awards, recognizing her fabulous leadership, such as the 2018 Atlanta Tribune Women's Award and Who's Who of Black Atlanta. And most recently, she was recognized as the top 100 influential, y'all heard that, top 100 influential women in Georgia engineering. I would like to present to you to discuss today the, uh, I'm sorry, let me go through all of the uh, bios before we get started. Uh, we also have with us Mr. Frederick Hicks. Frederick Hicks is the founder and president of Hicks Evaluation Group, most affectionately known as HEG. 
it is a consulting firm. I, I have to correct your bio. It is a winning consulting firm specializing in candidate and issue campaigns, consulting and public affairs. The firm has provided consulting services to numerous clients uh, across the country since its creation in 2006. And his current work is focusing on targeting and data analytics, consulting, polling, and training candidates office. He has been cited in Politico, the Huffington Point, Post, Talking Points Memo, FoxNews.com, NBCNews.com, and the Atlanta Journal and Constitution, the Jacksonville Times Union, and featured on television and radio as a regular commentator on political issues. His accomplishments include Top 40 Under 40 in 2015, and in 2019, he was named the top political strategist in Georgia, as well as the top 25 extraordinary Atlantans. We'll welcome Mr. Frederick Hicks. In addition, now you guys are going to know this lady, she does not require any introduction, but I'm going to give it to you anyway, just so we can brag on her. We have Miss Helen Butler, who serves as the Executive Director of the Georgia Coalition for the People's Agenda, an advocacy organization comprised of representatives from the human rights, civil rights, environmental, labor, women, young professionals, youth, elected officials, peace and justice groups throughout the United States of Georgia and other Southeastern states, convened by Dr. Joseph E. Lowry. She joined the Coalition for the People's Agenda in 2003 as the state director, promoting collaborative issues, campaign organizing activities throughout the state of Georgia, nationally, and the Southeastern region. In keeping with the People's Agenda commitment to quality education, criminal justice reform, protecting the right to vote, economic justice, development, all other social justice issues, she has formed a strategic alliances to approve the quality of life for communities of color. Helen also served as the 2000 election cycle as the NAACP Voter Fund's fifth congressional district coordinator and subsequently as the state coordinator for the NAACP Voter Empowerment Program in 2001 and 2002. And as a result of those efforts, tracking the statistical results of the 2000 election and problems encountered with the voting process, the method of recording elections results was changed by the Secretary of State. And I'm that little underhanded way that they did in this most recent election. So let's welcome Ms. Helen Butler. And last but certainly not least, we have Belinda Pedroso. Belinda Pedroso is an accomplished financial professional possessing 25 years of experience in financial management. She specializes in financial planning and investment taxes, and audit. She is the founding board member of Rose PAC, which is an organization that raises funds for Black women seeking elected office. We're going to talk about that fundraising, y'all, and PACs that help to raise money is an important, important role. She's an active member and volunteer in her community with the Decatur Alumni Chapter of Delta Sigma Theta Sorority Incorporated, a board member of the DeKalb Chamber of Commerce and the United Way of Metro Atlanta, the National Council of Negro Women, and past president of the DeKalb section of the NCNW and DeKalb League of Women Voters. She has received acknowledgments from the Atlanta Business League, 100 Most Influential Women in Atlanta, Leadership DeKalb, Who's Who in Black Atlanta, and the YWCA Leadership Academy and others. Can we all please give a warm welcome to all of our presenters tonight and welcome them for being here. So the first up, uh, I will bring Ms. Helen Butler, who we just introduced, and she's going to tell us a little bit about the 2020 election cycle and give us an overview, talk about some of those changes that they have from the general to the runoff election and different trends working uh, that are going throughout the state. So without further ado, I would like to introduce Ms. Helen Butler. Okay, thank you, uh, Ladine. Thank you so much. I'm glad to be here with everyone. Uh, just so happy to take a look back, but also going forward on how we got here and where we need to go for the future. Uh, we know that we had a, a great election for both the general election in 2020 and the uh, 2021. Uh, runoff election. So if you would put up the PowerPoint, please. Uh, oh, you're going to let me share it. PowerPoint is being shared. 
Okay. Everyone okay. seeing it? Okay, gotcha. Next slide, please. So we're gonna really celebrate the ballot power of women in the state of Georgia as we take a look at what happened uh, for this election cycle. Next slide, please. Well, one thing we have to always start with when we talk about our efforts to get people engaged, we first have to get them registered to vote. And of course, that's an activity that we all do 365 days a year. And what we saw in between the runoff election, the most significant information is between the runoff election and the general election, there was a 103,000 increase in voter registration just between that period of time. And of course, uh, 15,000 of those were black females and overall 33,000 black male uh, blacks that were registered to vote. You'll also see, also see to the right there a chart uh, talk about comparison of data for runoff elections from 2016, 2018, and uh, the last election cycle. But I just want to highlight the numbers uh, increase in voter registration. That means we got out work, y'all, 103,000 voter registrations, but we only had 33,000 total, uh, 15,000 of which were Black. Next slide, please. If you look at the turnout results uh, from the runoff election, uh, while we had this great increase in voter registration, uh, the numbers for the general election were very, very high. Uh, we had over 5 million people uh, that actually turned out to vote. And of course, in the runoff election though, we lost about 500,000 of those who didn't show up to vote. Uh, 73,000 decrease in the number of female voters that cast their vote. Uh, and overall, 100,000 uh, decrease from the general election down to uh, the uh, runoff election. Next slide, please. And of course, that also correlates to a, a, the percent of turnout uh, for each election cycle. We had a 65% turnout rate for the general election and it turned out for the general, uh, for the runoff, we had a 58%. So we did pretty good in terms of the turnout rate, but it still wasn't as good and we needed to do that. Next slide, please. Now here is the number that we always come up with. This is a number to me that really says it all. In the general election versus the runoff election, 600,000 people didn't vote. But if you look at 88,000 Black females didn't vote in the runoff election who had voted in the general election, and Blacks as a whole was about 147,000 people that didn't vote. But more specifically, if you look at each election cycle. In 2020, 914,000 Black people who were registered to vote but didn't show up to vote. Uh, so that is a number we have to work on. And in the runoff election, we saw an increase of uh, people not voting. So it was um, over a million Black people who were registered to vote but didn't show up to vote. So we've got to change those dynamics in getting people to really turn out. Next slide. And of course the percentages are there, but let's go to the next slide because I wanna make sure we cover most of it. Now let's look at the political landscape in Georgia. I tell you, I like numbers. I'm a, accounted by trade. So I always look at numbers. Black people comprise the majority registered voters in four congressional districts. That's 28% of the total. And we comprise 17 uh, majority in the Senate district, which is about a 30%. House districts 59 out of 180 and in uh, out of 159 
counties in Georgia, we are the absolute majority registered voters in 28 counties. Now that's including the black males who make up the 28 black females are in 27 majority, are the majority in 27 counties, but black males uh, are the majority in Talifera, Talifer, whatever way you want to pronounce it. And out of the 528 cities, we are the absolute majority registered voters in 92 cities. So coming up to municipal elections, these numbers are significant for us. I can tell you that's a decrease from 150 where we were in 2018. So we lost some ground in our cities that we evidently need to pick back up. Next slide, please. And of course, this just gives you a breakdown by uh, political uh, congressional districts of the four that we are the majority registered voters. Of course, we have one uh, black female, which is in the fifth congressional district where we make up the majority. But overall, you'll see why coalition districts are work for us because we have overall three females out of the 14 congressional district, two of which are black and one is white. Of course, let's go to the next slide. Senate districts, you can't read that number, but that information is will be available to you. We have the 17 Senate districts. And guess what, you all? Even though we have 17 where we are the majority, we have one district, a Senate district that is held by a white incumbent. Uh, of course, that is Senator Nan Arrock, uh, who's in uh, uh, Senate District 36. Next slide, please. Now in House districts, we got, we are the majority in 59 of those. But of the 59, there are four districts where there are white incumbents. There are two where there are Hispanic incumbents and two where there are Asian Pacific Islanders. So you see what is available. We are the majority registered voters, but of course uh, we have representation that is diverse in those house districts. Next slide, please. And of course, that's just a breakdown with numbers. Go to the next slide, please. Counties, we are the majority registered voters in 28 counties, but of course that one county is black male versus female. Uh, so these are the list of counties. If you live in one of those counties, that tells you uh, some of the dynamics for your particular county that you can use as information to build upon. Next slide. Out of the 528 cities, these are the 92 cities where uh, Black females are the majority registered voters. And I mean, they go from Albany to Atlanta, down to Walthersville, uh, Waynesboro, Rins, and all in between Montezuma, Norwood, and Norcross. So the list goes on and on. Next slide, please. What about building the wins? Sometimes we can't just rely on majority districts that where we are the majority registered voters, but there are potentials as you will see in how redistricting impacts this as well, where you can build coalition districts. So just let's just take a look and I'm being nonpartisan. I'm not saying who should be in these districts. I'm just telling you what the possibilities might look like. So next slide, please. Well, there are, as I see it, about seven districts that are potential uh, for co building coalition, meaning that black people make up a, a large portion of those districts along with Asian Americans, the Hispanics or uh, Native Americans 
that if you coalesce together, there are possibilities for win. Uh, and you will see the current incumbent, Nikki Merritt, actually did that in her district. The Blacks make up 28.5%, but she built that coalition so that she became the winner of that particular district. Uh, so, and if you look at the eighth uh, Senate district, that is the district that is currently held by the governor's floor leader, where Blacks make up, uh, Black females make up 32% of that district. So if you coalesce with others, uh, groups, you, there is a possibility for win. So those are things that we'd like to take a look at. Next slide, please. Same thing for house districts. Um, as you can tell, there are lots of house districts that have that same capability of building coalitions that make for a win. Uh, evidenced by a House District 101, uh, where Park, uh, Sam Park is the incumbent. 109, uh, really, Regina Lewis Ward uh, is also one of those types of districts. So there are uh, possibilities, as you can tell, in House District 73, 95, 101, 104, 106, 107, 109, uh, and so forth. So you see those districts that are available uh, that if you just look at, and I'm totally just looking at registrations because you look at other factors as Fred will tell you in terms of their voting history, but I'm just trying to give you a simple analysis of how to look at it. Next slide, please. And of course, with all of this, the districts that I provided to you are not locked in stone. Why? Because reapportionment is happening. We will have a special section later on in the fall and redistricting will be a very critical to what kind of coalition, uh, coalition districts uh, will be available as well as what our, our incumbent districts or other districts are. And as you see, based on the data from the census of uh, the large changes in the makeup of the House, US House of Representatives have been in the South, in Florida, North Carolina, uh, Texas, Colorado, Mount, Montana, they're not South, but those are the majority ones. Um, and of course, the ones with the purple are losing, of course, Georgia retains 14, even though a lot of us thought we would be gaining additional districts. And who knows, based on how we all get engaged in redistricting, what districts may come out. So you have the numbers. It's all about the numbers. Next slide, please. Registration, education, mobilization, advocacy, election protection, and accountability is it. As you see, numbers matter and numbers can make the difference. And that's what we have to remember. Numbers matter. Thank you. Excellent, excellent, excellent. Now you guys remember that if you have questions, even though Helen broke that down in a way, <laughs> she, we don't have many questions aren't needed because what we can see now is that we can all get involved. But if you do have questions, please don't forget to put them in the chat uh, and we will answer them during the Q&A section. Don't forget to put those questions in the chat. And remember, we have some door prizes. So you guys pay attention. You might get quizzed on some of those numbers so that you can uh, be eligible for some of those door prizes. So we are going to keep moving this program right along because it is packed full of information that you all would need to know to help participate in this upcoming election cycle. So um, next we're going to talk with Ms. Belinda Pedroso where she is going to go over the available 2021 and 2022 election seats um, elected as well as appointed, um, as well as discuss the organizational support and the importance of donating during campaigns. And so without further ado, I'm going to hand the mic over to Ms. Belinda Pedroso. 
thank you so much. So I need technical assistance. So if you would uh, move the slides, I wanna thank you all for inviting Rose Pack to speak um, about this very, very important issue. So my issue is, or Rose Pack, we are talking about sisters being elected, women of color, black women, women of color, that we can find, recruit, and also help fund their campaigns. Next slide. So one of the things that I want everyone on this video right now to watch is that you are the most powerful woman in the room. Very often we think that we are not, but we are. Very often we think we're unprepared, but we are more prepared than what we think we are. So you have to get that down in your spirit because what I'm talking about is women who are vying for election. Next slide. So who is Rose Pack? Well, Rose Pack is a nonpartisan committee and our purpose is to create opportunities for women of color to be elected. Some of the things that we do is that we advocate for women to be elected, which is what I'm doing here tonight, trying to get women to run for office and find and recruit candidates. Uh, we conduct fundraisers to support candidates. Um, because fundraising is very, very important. And I'm sure that our elected officials who are in and on this webinar will tell you, you gotta have the money. You gotta have the money. You gotta reach people. Uh, we also look at creating a public policy agenda, those things that are most important um, for women and for us, education, healthcare, health in general. And then we disseminate that information through our media sources. So basically our goal is to, pro is to promote a just and balanced equitable policies for women. And we do that through different events and activities like the one we're participating in tonight. Next slide. So I'm gonna talk about women and what did women voters look like in Georgia? Now, this was the information that was downloaded from the Secretary of State um, from the general elections. And I know you guys are probably on overload because you had the numbers nerds back together, but this is really important when you start talking about women who vote in Georgia. We are the most powerful person in the room. So of the number of just women who registered and the number of women who cast vote, 68% of the votes in the general election were cast by women. So what does that tell you? That just tells you that women decided the election outcome, which is very, very important. The percent of registered women voters, we had 53% who were actually registered and then 55% actually cast votes. So we're, now we're just gonna look at black women or women of color. So we had a million two women of color, black women who were in the state who were eligible to vote. 837,000 women voted. So the percent of black women that voted was 65%, which was the second, actually, if you look at individual voting blocks, black women are the highest voting block in Georgia and uh, probably across the country in most elections. So when, when you heard the president set, get out last year and say he wanted to thank the black community, yeah, black women vote. We believe in the election process. Next slide. So in Georgia, again, because we're focusing on Georgia, what are the top counties in Georgia that have the greatest number of voters. Look, black women lead in the top 10 counties in Georgia. Now I'm gonna give you a moment to absorb that. So we're talking about Fulton, DeKalb, Gwinnett, Clayton, Henry, Chatham, Richmond, Muskogee, and Bibb. So there's a very specific reason why it is that way because each of those counties are the seats of the major cities in Georgia. And 
we go where we can get work. So those are also places where black women can find employment. So you have a high population of black women in these counties. But then you go to tier two, um, the 11 through 20 counties, which have the second highest population of black women and black women who vote. So then you're looking at Douglas, which is right outside. We know where Douglas County is to the west of us, Dowdy, Newton, Rockdale, Houston or Houston, depending on where you're from, Lowndes County, Paulding, Clark, Fayette and Columbia. Again, these counties are adjacent as well to major metropolitan areas. So this gives you um, a bird's eye view, an opportunity to look at where are the opportunities for black women who are interested in elected office? Where can you vote, develop coalitions and also recruit a population of women who will listen to your message? And it's very important because we're talking about surrounding in large metropolitan areas. Next slide. So they asked me to talk about what positions are open for elected office. Well, ladies, everything is open for elected office. So in 2021, you have municipal offices, city council seats, county commissioners. And I just gave you the top 20 counties in the state surrounding where you also have very high population of black women who are a vote. Well, a lot of those county seats are open for election. You got school board members. There is a school board district in each of those 20 counties. School boards are open for election. Those seats are up for election. And then the county board of elections. I wanna stop here for one moment because something really interesting happened in legislation this year. And we're also having in DeKalb County, there is an open seat on the DeKalb County Board of Elections. Well, ladies, in most county, there are open seats on the, on the Board of Elections. You just have to go to the Board of Elections website, download the application, fill it out. You are competent. Trust me, believe in yourself. So 22 is a huge, huge election year, right? So what are we talking about? We're talking about the judges of superior courts. You have to look at the number of court districts in all of Georgia, the judge of the court of appeals, the appellate courts, and then the justice of the Supreme Court. They've already announced who is vying for election. election. Then you have judges of the state court. And I know there are a lot of attorneys out here in our group and listening tonight. So some of our attorneys might want to take advantage of this and fill out the application and apply for these positions because they're positions like applying for a job. Then you got the House of Representatives and the Georgia congressional seats, 14 of them. Everybody runs for re-election in an even year. So there are opportunities and possibilities. Now, what's more interesting are appointed positions. And in order to get an appointed position, you have to be in the mix. And what I mean by being in the mix is increase your volunteer visibility. Your volunteer visibility, vote, I mean, um, get appointed to some of these boards like United Way, uh, the Chamber of Commerce Board, um, local senior citizens board, municipal and county committees. Um, I first became very, very involved in municipal um, political situations when I was appointed to the county audit committee. So there is an audit committee in just about every county. Now, how do you get appointed to those committees? You have to make yourself available. And the first thing you do is you chart out what committee you want. Then you find out who is the county chairperson over that committee. So it's a little bit of homework involved. Uh, Helen is also telling me that the mayors and um, city court clerks are also available for election. 
So you have to do the research. Once you do the research, you'll see there are more opportunities than you know. But for appointed positions, volunteerism, um, another big one is if you've applied for a leadership program. So just about every county has a leadership program. There's Leadership DeKalb, Leadership Henry County, Leadership Atlanta, Leadership Fulton County. There are a lot of leadership programs and those are the ones um, that provide you with exposure as well. Next slide. So this is a really important slide here. We have 14 congressional districts. There are eight Republicans, six Democrats as of 2021. The rules are you got to be at least 25 years old, a U.S. citizen for at least seven years. You got to live in the state, though you do not necessarily have to live in the district where you are vying for that congressional seat. They are elected every two years, or D put a, a note in the chat saying, calling them constitutional officers. They are elected in even years. So our next election is 2022. Now, what is significant about this slide and that I put push pins in where you can see there is the influence. So the red push pins represent the Republicans, the blue push, pin, push pins represent the Democratic districts. The importance here again is you're looking at the high population of, of environments, locations that are populated heavily by women and women vote. So it's no secret if you have a high population of women, a high population of minority, African-American, Asian Pacific people, Asian people, if they are located around metropolitan areas, there's a high propensity that you might be a good candidate for election in that district. But then look at the eight push pins. Just look at the eight push pins. They're all on the outside of the major metropolitan areas. And again, you don't have to live in that district to run for election. So there are opportunities for you to run for, let's say, let's pick on Marjorie Greene's District 14. She's been in the newspaper a lot lately. There's an opportunity there, okay? There is an opportunity down by Savannah and Augusta. There are opportunities there because you're looking at district where there are high population of people of color. Next slide. So in the House of Representatives, 180 members, the black push pins there, I wanted to indicate, we talked about where there were possibilities where you could run for a district. And what I did was coordinate the counties that are on the outskirts of major metropolitan areas that also have a higher population of women of color who are registered to vote. So once you coalesce those together and overlap them, and some of these are in environments that are Republican districts. So we're talking about Douglas, Dougherty, Newton, Rockdale, Houston or Houston, depending on where you're from, Lowndes, Paulding, Clark, Fayette, and Columbia. Again, these are communities or counties where there's A, a high population of African-American women who are registered to vote, and B, as Helen talked about a little bit earlier, where there are coalitions that you can actually pull into a group to create a winning atmosphere for women who want to vie for elected office. And so when you look at the map on your left, you can see where most of the opportunity is in South Georgia. Most women live in North Georgia around centers where there's economic development and where they can find employment. And that is significant to note because if you lived in South Georgia, there are a lot of black women or women of color in South Georgia who would be eligible to run 
for office. Those are the women that we have to find. You see that push pin all the way down on the bottom, right near the Florida line? Great opportunity there. Great opportunity up by Athens in Clark County. Great opportunity there where there's a very high population of African-American people, Black women, and a majority Black voting county. Next slide. Okay, so I was asked if we could look at resources to run for election. There are a lot of resources out there to run for election. I think one of the critical things, and um, I think Fred's gonna talk about this, is that when you decide you wanna run for election, the first thing that you have to do is you gotta get your kitchen cabinet together and you have to look at your opportunities for running. So, and of course, funding is a very important part. And that's why I'm here, Rose Pack. So we look at candidates who are interested in office by application, and you can download that application on our website, which is listed there, rose-pack.org. Um, another opportunity for funding is the win list. Some of you are probably familiar with this, but you should become familiar with all the opportunities that are out there for either you to um, secure funding or to obtain training. Um, training, we highly, highly recommend that you participate in a run training program. And what we're recommending is the Vote Run Lead um, organization. Many of us have already participated in Vote Run Lead. I did. And they have a phenomenal program going now called Run 51. And that is a shift to in the representation of women who will become elected to office. Uh, but your first stop on the bandwagon before you even get a campaign manager is that you need to call on the Secretary of State website. You don't have to call them. You can go right to the Secretary of State website. They have a whole directory there, elections dates that are already out for 21 and 22 and information on how to qualify for election. It's important that you understand the process of qualifying for election because there are many things that you have to do, including fundraising, banking, ethics. And that's not what I do. What I do is only talk about the money. So when you come to Rose Pack, you wanna to talk to us about the money. But in terms of resources, the Secretary of State is a very good resource to help you get yourself oriented to the election process. Next slide. <clears throat> So what Rose Pack has right now, and we're encouraging everyone to donate. So this is my ask of everyone in this audience today. The ask is, if you are a woman, all women here mostly, right? Except maybe a couple of guys run for office. You are qualified to run for office. If you don't wanna actually run for office, support a woman's campaign's efforts. There are many positions that you can fulfill in campaign, marketing, communications, literature drops. You can help get the vote out for your candidate. Attend a run training. Educate yourself on what is necessary, including actually filing the application with the intent to seek elected office. And I noticed someone put that note in the chat. Um, that is very, very critical because there are fees that go along with all of that. And you want to make sure you have your funding, your fees, and your registrations together. And lastly, I would ask you to contribute to the Rose Pack. You can go on our website, rose-pack.org, and on the upper right-hand corner, there's a donate button there. What that does is provide funding for women who do want to run for elected office. You got to have the money. And that's one of the things that we do. We help support women. 
Our campaign that we've just recently launched is called Power of the Purse. And the Power of the Purse speaks to the fact that women have great power in the outcomes of elections, but we also have great economic power too because we work in those central key economic environments. Next slide. And I'll wrap this up and leave you with donate to us through PayPal. You can contact me through rosepack2020 at gmail.com. Um, and I will be more than happy to talk with you about uh, women's representation and funding for women who are seeking elected office. Thank you very much for your time this evening. I look forward to speaking to you soon. Excellent, excellent, excellent. Can we please give a round of applause, a Zoom round of applause for our speaker. Um, that was excellent information. Highlight some things that she said. You're ready. You are more than qualified as you are right now to run for office. And I echo her sentiments about preparing to run. So when should you actually start preparing to run for office? Well, here's a clue. Not when you actually want to jump in the race. Now you can, right? We've seen some really successful candidates that said, hey, it's qualifying next month. I think I'm going to do this. They jump into the race and they win. But the best candidates train and plan in advance. So even if you're thinking, oh, I'm going to wait until my children reach a certain age, which is something that a lot of women often say, right? Or I want to wait till I'm a certain place in my career or I've accomplished this goal. It's not too early to start planning now to run because those skills, that science that we talked about to run for office, it doesn't change. Those basics of grassroots campaigning, touching people, meeting people is very, very important. So that was an excellently informative campaign. We have some great information in the chat that I do wanna share before I bring up the next speaker. Uh, just as a point of clarification on uh, if you are going to be a part of the Board of Elections. So apparently Chatham County, um, they have where you can run for the Board of Elections, but a lot of other jurisdictions appoint their Board of Elections. But there's not a big secret to it. So the way that they are appointed is based on the charter for their counties. And in those county charters, you'll see that um, someone can be appointed by the Democrats or Republicans. Some are appointed by the judges in the county. Some are appointed by the state representatives. And so all you need to do is look up for your county online to find out exactly how they are, how they are appointed and reach out to those individuals and let them know that you're interested. That role is key to understanding how politics works. It's key to make sure that those elections are fair. And we know after 2021 and this most recent legislative session, there's nothing more important than having people in the position, right? A seat at the table is what we often ask right? Well, that is the table and the seat that we need people in to ensure that our elections are fair. Um, and many times we don't know what those people do behind the scenes, but their jobs are extremely important. So excellent, excellent presentation. All right, next up, we are going to bring up a great friend of mine, Mr. Frederick Hicks. I've already introduced him, and today he is going to talk to you about if you're thinking about running, what do you need to do to win, and give you a high-level overview of the entire campaign process. So without further ado, I would like to present to you HEG President, Mr. Fred Hicks. All righty. Thank you, LaDon, for the uh, introduction. And thank you to the Stone Mountain uh, Chapter of BSC for having me back with you all. I love doing these. and I love working with the chapter to help prepare women to run for office. Um, that's the guy, as the male uh, presenting here today. I, um, I want to say that really to echo the sentiments that LaDon and, and all the great presenters have said already, that you are more than able, you are more than qualified to run for office. I've had the great privilege of working with a number of women, a number of history-making women uh, for office. And right here in DeKalb, I'm proud to say that I ran the campaign for Sheriff Melody Maddox, the first ever woman, black or white, to serve as the sheriff of DeKalb County. And that was a fantastic uh, learning experience for me and a great partnership in working with our sheriff. I've also worked with our district attorney uh, my solicitor, several of our judges here in DeKalb County, um, and also Zuma Lopez, who was the newly elected state representative of House District 86. We ran that campaign. And I will tell you that as a woman, you are 
ready, you are able. And yes, there are additional pressures that a lot of men do not face, but you have a unique ability that men do not have. And that is a, that is the ability to relate, to communicate, and really to see things in ways that we simply don't. Um, I've been involved with more than 200 campaigns, about 250 campaigns over the 15, now going to our 16th year of business. And I'll tell you, it is very interesting. Um, the, the, it's very interesting what goes into a campaign. And I'm always amazed and I always try to encourage more women to run for office. I uh, served as a trainer and, and helped uh, help create the Judicial Planning Academy for GAPWA uh, back in 2011. So this year is our 10th anniversary, along with then President um, Jamal McFadden, was really her idea. I had just a small part in it and helping conceptualize it. And the idea then was we needed to prepare Black women to run for office and to fill positions in the judiciary and other, um, require, other positions that require a law degree. I've also had an opportunity to work with a lot of other organizations and training candidates to run for office. And again, I, I have to say this, um, that uh, there's a stat on LaDon and the others probably know it better than I do, but so many women are not asked to run. So by the virtue of you being here today, I wanna make sure that I, before I do anything else in this presentation, that we ask you to run. We need you. We need your ability to see the field. We need your 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 thoughts we need your energy we need your time we need your consideration so please do not think that running for office is just for someone else it is for you also and then also looking ahead to 22 2022 we're seeing a lot of people who are in elected office uh electing to run for other positions so in addition to the positions that they talked about in the previous slides there are just a number of openings particularly in the state house and other and other positions along the way that are coming open and so you want to prepare yourself now and being here tonight is an important step towards the, towards being prepared to run but there are a lot of opportunities and so we don't want you to think okay 2026 maybe 2020 2030 or something like that there are a lot of opportunities that are going to be available across the metropolitan area across georgia in 2022 so make sure you take a look at at where you live and, and positions for which you could run one other thing i want to mention um, and i think we touched on it a little bit is that this year, we are going through the redistricting process, which means that um, new lines are going to be drawn for everything from school board, city council, all the way up to the state house and the state senate. So you want to take a look at where you live now. And then once the process is complete, probably September, October, or something like that, we should have new lines. You want to take a look at that. I'll give you an example. About 10 years ago, uh, Tanya Anderson, who's now our state senator for State Senate District 43, former mayor of Lithonia. Uh, she was in a district that did not exist at the time, and then a new House district was created, House District 92, and uh, we filed the last day of qualifying, and we ran and we won that seat there in, in House District 92. So again, it was a seat that did not exist before, but it came, became open, and so that we, we ran and we won, won that position, and that opened up the door eventually to for her to serve as the uh, in the state Senate, where she now is the chair for the Georgia Legislative Black Caucus and as a national political action chair for the National Organization of Black Elected Women Officials. So, well, legislators, I'm sorry, Nobel, Nobel women. So I say this to, 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 to help paint the picture for you that when the opportunity is there, you want to take advantage of it and you never really know where it's going to lead. So uh, we'll talk a little bit about getting prepared and things like that. But again, I want to ask you to run for office even if no one else does ever again after you leave here today, please do run for office. And so with that being said, we'll go into the slides. And one thing I do want to say, and we'll talk about this here, I saw the comment from Holly Smith um, over there at the, uh, who works with the state and, and, and helps people with their qualifying for office. And um, she mentioned that before you collect money, you want to file the DOI and we'll talk about that. But the, leading into the presentation, the next slide, so I want to say that the sequence of things really, really, really matters. Uh, a lot of times when people do decide to run, they haven't done their due diligence. And so they get out there and they forget to file a piece of paperwork or something like that. And it ends up costing you. Uh, it can cost you your eligibility to run or it could cost you a fine. So you want to make sure that uh, right now, while you're thinking about running, that you take the time to read up and understand the rules and regulations around what it takes to qualify, what it takes to be a candidate. Uh, for office. And so aside from the paperwork, we have a little thing here that, so you want to run for office, you need to start getting ready. 
If you've not already, there are two categories or two ways that I break down getting ready to run for office. On the personal side, a lot of these things are basic, but they are often overlooked. Start scrubbing your, your social media before you share your interest in running for office. And here's what I mean by that. A lot of times people decide, hey, I'm gonna run for office and they still have their party pictures up. Uh, they have uh, you know, pictures of their family and just whatever, things that they would not necessarily want out there as a candidate. Well, once you start telling people that you're thinking about running for office, then people are gonna start looking at your social media in a different way. And they have all kinds of programs out there that will just scrape social media and, 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 uh, and log it. So before you ever really publicly share your interest in running for office, I encourage everyone to go scrub your social media, take a look at it. Well, people aren't paying attention to it, but they don't know that you have an interest in running for office. So they won't necessarily notice that you've moved things or, or removed things. Now, scrubbing it can be anything from, from photos or crazy comments or anything like that that you've made to simply putting things like your family. A lot of people do not want images of their children out there on the internet when they run for office because running for office is a sometimes a contact sport. So for whatever reason, you'll want to make sure you review and you scrub your social media. That's your Twitter, your Instagram, your Facebook. Uh, just anything that's negative that's out there that can be found will be found. So before you ever publicly announce your interest in running for office, I strongly encourage you to go through review and scrub your social media. The next thing I encourage you to do is do a background check on yourself. Uh, you can do a LexisNexis background check. You can go all the way through hiring a, a, a PI firm, a private investigator firm. But you want to do a basic search, like go through Google, go through Yahoo, go through Bing, search, search for yourself and see what's out there. Uh, you'll want to look at, uh, make sure you pull your credit and make sure you pull these other things about you. Not that any of these things will eliminate you from running for office, but you want to know everything about you that anyone else will know about you before you get out there and run. Again, we've been involved with more than 200, about 250 campaigns. And I will share that I am amazed at what I find on Google when I'm doing a campaign. Um, and so just take a moment or two, take a few days and look through Google. And don't stop at the first page. Go all the way through page two, three, four, five, seven, however many pages there are of Google out there and make sure that you've researched yourself. And again, I would encourage you to do a, bit, a little bit more of extensive background check and depending on the position and things like that, you can go even further with it and do a full, full on, um, full on deep dive with the background check on yourself. But uh, you do want to make sure you do a background check because what can't, whatever can be found will be found. And the question is whether or not it's used. And the other thing is preparing yourself financially to run uh, for the campaign and for the office. And I break that into two for a reason. I've worked with people who were not prepared for the campaign and I've worked with people who were prepared for the campaign, but not prepared for the financial constraints in the case of many people uh, of being in, being in office. Look, public office should not be your primary career. I'm gonna say it again. Public office should not be your primary career. As a matter of fact, if someone comes to me and says, hey, they want to run for office and this is what they want to do because they want to make money, I won't work with them. Um, so you want to make sure that you prepared yourself financially. A lot of times, public office will actually require you to or cost you money. So what I mean by that is the state house pays about 17000 17, a year. So if you are in private business, uh, you have to plan each year if you win to be away from your business from January to the end of March, beginning of April. And that can be really tough because you're giving up basically an entire quarter, financial quarter of earnings to some extent or another for a job that pays $17,000 a year. That's a huge sacrifice. If you are a very successful attorney and you're winning multi-million dollar cases and you decide you want to become a judge, well, a judge only makes somewhere between, depending on the judge, maybe 140, 150, 180. And I say just compared to high earnings. And so that sometimes can be an adjustment as well. So when you decided you want to run for office and put your, offer yourself up for public service, you have to make sure that you take the time to get yourself right financially. And that's not necessarily to win the election, but that's to make sure that you can, you can uh, fulfill the, the duties of the campaign or expected of you in the campaign and also that you can fulfill the duties of uh, the office. Again, if you, think, if you are thinking about running for public office because you wanna get rich, that's really not the way to do it. Public service, public office is just that service and it does not pay a whole lot, um, especially here in Georgia.
And even though these positions are a lot of times listed as part-time, so you're a part-time legislator, you're a part-time commissioner, uh, they really require you to be on duty close to 24, if not for 24 hours a day, seven days a week for the entire year. So if you run for the legislature, once you get out of session, your schedule does ease up, but there can be a special, a special session call like we did last year to deal with COVID, where we're going to have a special session this year to deal with the new lines. So even though they just finished session at the end of March, they're going to be back in there for a few days, maybe a couple of weeks in the fall. And so again, that's going to be time that you are away from your business or your company or your job or your family. So you want to make sure on the personal side that you prepare yourself financially to run for office. Uh, Belinda talked about the, the money to run for office, that there's a budget and all that. And we'll talk about that a little bit. But we're also just talking about that you make, you make sure that you and your family are, are, are financially okay if you decide to run for office. That's on the personal side. On the professional side, um, taking, taking a step onto the other side, uh, preparing yourself financially, a lot of times people who run for office work somewhere. They work for the state or they work for the government or they work for a firm or something like that. And you need to take the time to make sure you understand your company's policies. Um, if you work for yourself and you decide to run for office, you want to make sure you align your business. But some, some jobs won't allow you to run for a partisan position. So if you wanted to run for the legislature or you want to run for the commission and you want to keep your job, your job might actually have something in there that prohibits you from doing that. So you have to make a decision. Do you want to run for another position, a nonpartisan position? Or do you want to keep working where you are working? And so uh, there's no judgment. Uh, on our end on which way you decide or um, to go with that, but it's something you have to consider. And so you might decide that, hey, I, can, I, I need to keep my job, so I'm gonna run for a nonpartisan position. Well, in Georgia, city council and mayoral positions tend to be nonpartisan. You tend to get into the partisan positions when you're looking at countywide or state positions like the state senator, state legislator, attorney general, um, state superintendent of schools or something like that. But if you want to be mayor, you want to be a city council person, those are often, generally, those are, are I should say, nonpartisan in Georgia. And so if your company has a prohibition against you seeking uh, partisan, a partisan position, then you can look at running for uh, a more local position, again, like mayor or city council. You also want to review your job performance reviews. So I say that because if you if you get out there and you decide to run and your boss or your previous boss uh, supports your opponent, that's a really bad look. Or let's say your 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 job reviews or your performance reviews or are, are, are available. Let's say you are an attorney and someone has filed a bar complaint against you and it was sustained. Well, people can get that information. Um, and even if there's information that's not supposed to be publicly available, there's a way that people can get a lot of that information. So you want to make sure that, again, you know everything about you that anyone outside there can find out about you. Don't put your head in the sand. If you decide to run for office or when you decide to run for office, please take the time to review everything about you, including your job performance reviews. Uh, it's in a campaign. Uh, one of the things that people, uh, consultants or campaign managers like me love to do is we look right at your kind of your performance because if you can't do your day job well, then why would a voter trust you to do the job of public service well? And so things like that um, are, are are really really important. So please, again, make sure you review your your job performance reviews before you get out there and you talk to your boss um, or your bosses, talk to your current and your former boss. Because again, once you get out there, you do not want the people who work for you or who, for whom you work to support the uh, the opponent. So it's a little story. I actually, we had a race sometime in the past where I found out that my opponent, um, that both of their previous bosses were not really happy with them and they were willing to support my candidate. And we actually did a piece that said, <laughs> their bosses are supporting me. So I need you to support, them, support me as well. And it was really damaging to the opponent. So Again, uh, we want to take time to do that. And then the other part about that is resolve any complaints against you. So again, if you're an attorney, whether you're running for a judicial position or you're running for anything like that, especially if you're an attorney, you'll want to take a look at those bar complaints, get anything that you can resolve. And even if you're not an attorney, let's say you just have some sour relationships with the past boss, do not, if you can help it, if you can help it, try to resolve those. Don't go into your campaign carrying any extra baggage. A campaign is difficult enough. A campaign 
I often say is one of the hardest things that you're going to do in your life, no matter how qualified and how solid you are and how prepared you are, a campaign is very, very tough. And so you don't want to take anything with you into the campaign that you don't have to. So again, know everything about yourself and resolve any complaints or any issues out there um, before you decide to before you decide to run. And I say before you decide to run, again, I, 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 when I say that, I mean before you ever even really share that you are, um, that you're thinking about running for office. There's one of the things, next slide, please. One of the things that I always tell people when they run for office is that the support that you get when you run is often going to come from people you, you don't necessarily know and people you wouldn't ex to ex expect to support you. And the people you just know are going to support you oftentimes don't support you or they don't support you in the way that you expect. And that can be really emotionally uh, damaging or draining to you. We have to work past that. But again, the people you think are gonna be your biggest supporters oftentimes are not. And so once you speak it into existence that you're running, they might start collecting information. So all these things, as much as you can, you wanna go ahead and start taking care of those things before you ever let someone know that you're running for office. So let's say you decided to run, you've gone through all those things like that, and you want to think, all right, I'm, I'm going to run for office. Well, I, I have two more categories here, before you are official and after you are official. And some things can move between either or, but I'm using the term official to mean once you qualify. So in Georgia, once you decide that you want to run for office, as the commenter, uh, as Holly mentioned in the comments, and you decide you're ready to collect money to run for office, you complete something that's called a DOI, Declaration of Intent. Um, if you're running for an office where you qualify with the state, you'll submit that with the state. It's a local level, you'll submit it, uh, submit it locally. But again, you cannot collect money. You're not even supposed to solicit funds until you've completed a, a DOI, a Declaration of Intent. And so, which is just a piece of paper that says, hey, I'm thinking about running for office and here's the seat I'm looking at, at running for. Um, and when it's up for election, you follow that, and then you can start the process of collecting money. And so, um, and as Tyler mentioned, there, you also cannot spend any money on the campaign. So a lot of times people will say, hey, Fred, I'm thinking about running for office, and I want to do some polling ahead of time. You can, but that that is, out of, that is going to come out of your pocket. You cannot say, okay, hey, I'm going to pay that out of the campaign. Um, so before you raise or spend uh, any money, you need to follow your DOI. Now, there are some exceptions, of course, and you can follow, check in the comments there. Like if you are planning to self-finance, so not you're not planning on on using any 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 funds, they can, you can do some gray areas with that. Uh, but I would encourage you to identify the position you want and the requirements, including residency. So you can go to ethics.ga.gov. Again, that's ethics.ga.gov. That's the state site, and there's is a wealth of, there's a wealth of information there. And I, I go to it all the time. I, I, I kind of smile when I see Holly commenting on the in, in the comments there because I think over the last couple of years we've become close to friends because I, I email her regularly um, and talk and, and we and we communicate quite often whenever I have a question about something. And so this is really important for you to understand. If you want to go to ethics.ga.gov, there's a repository of information there uh, for for you. And again, it's not that I don't have any special access. Uh, is public information, and I'm not afraid to ask, and you shouldn't be afraid to ask either. It's uh, better to be safe than sorry, and it's cheaper to ask than to assume. So with that being said, identify the position you want and the requirements. So if you want to run for, um, if you want to be a judge, then the state bar, the state has certain rules, like you have to have been barred in Georgia for at least seven years before you can run for a judicial position. So stuff like that. Or if you want to run for a county commission seat, you need to know the residency requirements around living in that county, which would be very different than, than the requirements if you, if you want to run for a mayor or a city council. Um, we have worked with, with folks before where we had opposition and we found out that the person did not meet the residency requirements and we filed and we had them removed from the ballot. That was a very valid thing. Um, and so you want to make sure that you understand the requirements, including residency, before you decide to run. So look at where you live and say, okay, I live at 123 Main Street. Here's my, here's the, here's my city council person. Here's my county commissioner. Here's my mayor. Here's my state rep. Here's my state senator. You know, here's, here's my, here, here, here are the judges who, uh, who represent me. And, and look at that and decide, you can look at that and decide where you where you want to uh, 
where you put the positions for which you like to run. Like in the city of Atlanta, even though you have districts, you also have post one and post two and post three at large. And so they are elected citywide, but you have to live in a certain city council district in order to run for post one or post two or post three. And so, but in DeKalb, for example, you have, to, if, if you decide you want to run for a county commission, you have district level commission seats, but then you have rather than at large countywide commissioners, you have two super districts, super district six and super district seven. And so you need to look and see where you live within the super district. And then of course you have the, the CEO position that is as elected countywide. So you wanna make sure that you know the rules for your particular area. If you live in the portion of, of, of Atlanta that's in DeKalb County, then you have a lot of positions for which you can run. You'll be eligible to run for city council, mayor, post, uh, post whatever at large in the city, or you're able to run for any of the, the, the DeKalb County positions, but not the Fulton County positions. So understand and know where you are, the positions that you can seek. The next piece of advice I'll give you before you are official is review the disclosures seeking an idea of the cost to run for office. If you're looking at running for a seat where you qualify with the state, that is state rep, state senator, superior court judge, statewide positions, all that information can be found again at ethics.ga.gov. And you can go there and you can look up the campaign disclosure reports to see how much money people raised and even how they spent their money. So it'll give you an idea, give you of what you, of what you need to do um, and how you can spend your money. So you wanna make sure you do that. If you are running for like a state court position um, or a county commission position, and it was after 2014, so there's some timelines and all that around there, you will have to, you can go look at your um, your county board of elections site to see again to find the disclosure reports that, uh, which will tell you how much money people raised and how they spent it and so different counties and different municipalities use different systems uh, if you're looking at stuff going back a few years you know different points in times people had to file their paperwork in different places so that part is a little tricky but the point is you want to do your research to get an idea of how much you're going to spend and how much you need to raise to run. Review the rules. I cannot tell you how important the rules are. Um, I, I'm pretty super solid on my rules, but again, if I'm not sure on something, Holly gets an email from me. And so um, there, there's no shame in that. And the rules will change from year to year. And so that's one of those things where you, because the legislature might, might change the rules around, uh, around, around a particular position, and so even if you ran for something 10 or 15, 20 years ago, the rules around that might have changed. So you want to get you want to you want to update yourself, your knowledge base with the uh, regarding the rules. So you want to make sure you do that. And then again, complete all the, re the requisite forms to collect money. The declaration of intent. I always have my folks follow form RC and incorporate their campaign accounts um, so that their, their campaign money is separate from them, uh, which means it protects your campaign money from creditors, debtors, all those kinds of things out there. Um, so I always try to, I always encourage my folks to incorporate their campaigns account, campaign accounts. And then you have build your, I have here that you wanna build your team. So you wanna look for your campaign consultant, manager. Uh, you wanna look for your finance person. You wanna look for like your, your core team of advisors. And then you go through the process of identifying your win number and outlining your budget. That should at least be based in part on what other people have raised um, who sought that same position. So after you, and all that's before you decide to run, that's your homework, right? That's before you take the test. But once you're out there, you, can, you, want, you, you want to go ahead and build your campaign calendar, starting from election day, all the way back to where you are right now. And then you'll want to uh, monitor your campaign budget consistently. Uh, we've seen this happen a million and one times where someone will get out there and they will blow through their campaign budget and the first part of the campaign and you won't have enough money to finish the race. But guess what? For our races that are in November of this year, um, you know, that November wall is, doesn't seem like it's that far away. Uh, six months is a long time. And uh, right now I'm working with Anata Narchabong um, who's running for, she's District 5 City Council at the cab and she's running for City Council President. And so when I built out our budget, we are like, all right, council we would build on the election day back and we look at, our, we look at uh, the end of the campaign, the start of the campaign, and then everything in between. And I say that because this is really, it's extremely important. Uh, we even saw in our sheriff's race last year in DeKalb that um, our opponents spent a lot of their energy, time, and money early on in the campaign doing, doing interesting things. I won't say crazy things. 
um, and we were very consistent and we were able to really just push away at the end. And I, and I talk about last year because, you know, with COVID uh, and the cab with the sheriff's race, Sheriff Maddox was on the ballot four times last year, four times. Um, and we ended up receiving 537,000 votes across those four elections. But imagine having to run in March, but then we stopped and then uh, there was pushed back to June. And so then we, in June, we were on the ballot twice for a special election and then also for the Democratic primary. So we won the Democratic primary, but had to go to a runoff in the special election, which is in August, and then we had to turn around and run in November. And so but understanding the calendar and it's something that Sheriff and I, we talked about in 2019, that we could have up to five elections, possibly in 2020, that we game plan for that and we budgeted for that. And there were a lot of people, and here's the thing, you're gonna have a lot of people cheering you on who, who, who tell you that you need to do this, you need to do that. Why aren't you doing this right now? Why aren't you doing that right now? And you have to monitor your budget because they'll, 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 they will mean well and uh, they will want you to win, but you, you can get out of position very easily and find yourself not able to complete the race. And so I cannot emphasize enough how important it is to build that calendar and to monitor your campaign budget. Then the other thing here is you want to make sure you keep up your records because you do have to file. And part of that campaign calendar needs to include when the money is due. So for example, uh, we just finished a campaign disclosure period uh, this past Friday, April 30th for my 2021 races. Uh, if you're looking at running in 2022, uh, you have a different campaign schedule because this is a non-election year. If you're already in office, you have yet a different schedule. So making sure you understand that campaign calendar and build into it and have a great campaign calendar is really, really important. Uh, so you have your paperwork, you have your calendar, you have your due dates. You have to know this information. Uh, fund, you got uh, talked about this a little bit. Uh, fund the end of the campaign first, your launch, and then go everything in between. And then grow your team. One of the other things, uh, common mistakes that I see candidates make is that they want to build a large team right off the bat. And it feels good to have people driving you. It feels good to have people waving signs everywhere you go. It feels good to have 2,000 yard signs and all of that, but you don't need all that at the very beginning. You got to build your team as you grow. You're going to start with a small core team, and then you're going to build. Uh, you guys probably hear the storm. Uh, but you're going to build concentric circles from there and grow your team as you go. But you need to start small, and this goes back to your budget. Start small and tight, and then grow. But again, I see a lot, I see so many people with big teams right off the bat, and they they end up blowing through their campaign budget because campaigns are expensive, and um, they're not able to finish the race. So next slide, please. So um, I won't spend a whole lot of time on this because it really gets into it, but you'll want to prioritize spending your money on direct versus indirect contact. And direct voter contact is just what it says. This is the method by which communication is, two -way, is, is a two-way street. So telephone calls, uh, knocking on doors. Uh, you can have a, a text bank where people are communicating back and forth with people, uh, the people with whom they're texting, but stuff like that. And direct voter contact is extremely effective. They say that if you knock on someone's door, you have an 80% chance of getting their vote. Uh, but depending on the size of the race, you might not be able to knock on every door. Again, we received 537,000 plus votes last year. We couldn't knock on that many doors. Uh, so we picked a few places here and there, but we worked, we worked very diligently on the sheriff's campaign last year to make sure that we could communicate um, with voters at every, every opportunity. So you want to prioritize your direct voter contact. Um, but then the larger the race, so you're looking at running statewide, um, or you're running in a large county like the Cab, or uh, we did the, the sheriff's race in Cobb County as well. Last year, we had almost 400,000 votes in the, um, in the November general election. You have to, at that point, you have to do a lot more indirect voter contact, which is expensive. So TV, radio, uh, texting, yard signs, digital marketing, things like that. So in your smaller races, you really want to prioritize direct voter contact and everywhere you can, you want it, you want to do it. But the larger the race, the bigger, the, the, the larger the number of people you have to get to vote for you, the more that you end up relying on indirect voter contact. And again, that can be very expensive. Um, in our city of Atlanta mayor's race in 2017, to give you an example, our campaign was $2.5 million and we didn't spend the most on that one. So, um, but then we've also done races where you know, the, the budget is 10,000 or 15,000. 
And that's why I say you want to go back and look at the uh, look at the campaign uh, disclosure reports. You can see how much money you can expect to raise uh, or spend, and that will give you an idea. Again, campaigns are expensive. They, they cost money. And so you have to figure out a way. I always tell people, you don't have to have the most money, but you have to have enough money to do what you need to do. Uh, so again, in, a, in, a, in our races in the cab, I mean, we've had 100,000, 250,000, 300,000. Um, we've also had them a little bit smaller when we're looking at some of the municipal races in the cab or significantly smaller. So again, you don't have to have the most, the most money in a race, but you really need to get a sense of what it's gonna take to run. And as part of that budget, you'll want to make sure you take into account what's called the qualifying fee, because it costs, a, the different positions cost different amounts of money. The state house costs roughly 300 and something dollars to run, uh, to run for that. But if you want to run for a uh, CEO or a sheriff or something like that, it's going to cost you four or $5,000 to qualify because it's based on the salary of the position. So the bottom line about all this is before you decide to run, do your research. You should know everything there is to know about you, and you should know, at least be familiar with the rules around running for the running for office. And then when you hire your team, when you hire your consultant, your manager, your finance person, or someone like that, make sure you, you're hiring someone who knows the rules. So at the end of the day, that's the last thing I'll say, at the end of the day, it's your name that's on the ballot, it's your name that's on the campaign side. And my campaign consultant, my finance person, they didn't tell me this. They didn't, uh, they, didn't, they didn't tell me that, that that's not an excuse. You are held accountable, by, be it by the state or by the voters. So at least have a working knowledge of the position and know the rules, build your calendar and be mindful of your budget. It's okay to ask every day or at least every week, hey, where are we financially? Do we have enough um, to, to finish? What else do we need to do? How much more do we need to raise? So. You do those kinds of things and you can be in good shape. But again, I want to encourage you. I do want to say all that being said, there's a lot of information. I'm still asking you to run for office. You are ready. You can do it. Do your homework. Do your research. Build a knowledgeable team and run for office. Excellent. That was so much great information. Can we get a Zoom round of applause for Mr. Hicks? I mean, what he gave you was truly a crash course and really understanding. And then I'm watching here in the comments, if you all have seen it, Holly Smith works for the Essex. She's right here on your call with you all. She has said, reach out to me if you need, if you have any questions about the process and the money so that you don't mess it up. Because I will tell you, there are people out there who I guess have nothing better to do and they will spend all day putting out on the internet and other places if your name shows up from filing late uh from having anything that is incorrect in your filing so you want to make sure that you even it won't even be your opponent that you're watching those things i want to hit on something before we go on to our next speaker that fred uh, touched on that is super important raising money now there are some candidates um particularly judges you see this most often who say you know what i just don't want to get out there and have to ask people for money and so they'll just take money out of their retirement account so that they can pay for their campaign let me strongly discourage anybody who is thinking of going that route think of this in two ways first you can do it i know it sounds hard but when you sit down and make that first list of all the people who you know right, going through your phone and your social media, all the way from pre-K to the guy that you met at Publix last week. Those people will, in fact, donate if you sit down and put the time in. So if you're like, wow, people are saying that this race might cost twenty, thirty, dollars $100,000 to run. I can't raise that money. Yes, you can. It is there to be raised, and I strongly encourage you guys to do it. And also think about it like this. If you can't get your grandma to give you $100, to run for your campaign, how are you going to get 100 voters plus some to come out and vote for you? So that same thing that's required to ask to raise money um, is, is necessary. Another thing I want to share with you real quick before we go on to the next speakers, uh, Fred mentioned uh, this redistricting process, and this is a very good time. So if you're somebody who's on the cusp, you are thinking about running, you're looking in your district that, that may change, this might be your time to run. 
I ran during a redistricting season. My district had grown um, to where they didn't create a new seat, but they redrew the seat. And so I did not run against an incumbent. And as you all know, incumbents tend to win 80% of the time when they run for their races. And so having an opportunity to be in a newly drawn seat where the voters don't know the people there is a great opportunity. So pay really close attention to what's going on with this redistricting process because they will have opportunities for you to go to town hall and speak up and say, here's where we want in our area for a new district. And it actually happens quite often, more, af more often than you would think, because people don't participate in that process. And you might find yourself also in a newly drawn seat. All right, y'all. Just, just tell, tell me real quick about that. So two things. I agree completely with everything she said. Number one, um, a lot of people will tell you, hey, go dip into your savings and go broke. I just don't believe in that. Uh, we need to work within what you, what you have. Um, and, and make it work. And then the second point uh, to, to what LaDawn said when she ran in 2012, uh, one of the things I'm very proud of is that we knew the district better than our opponent with, in that one. And so with that seat of how to 62 previously, it was heavy city of Atlanta, but after the redistricting, it was heavier outside of the city of Atlanta. And so in our conversation, we worked together on that race in 2012 with Maisha, our partner, political coach, um, who's the campaign manager for that one. And, um, and then when we, when we dug into the data, we saw a huge advantage and we just really ran it. I'll be honest with you, you know, um, you know, in that race, it was what, probably three, four or five of us. There weren't very many people with us. And our opponent had, uh, had the mayor, then mayor of Atlanta, the entire city council over there supporting, but they just didn't take the time to understand the data. And we won with 62, 38, I think it was in the runoff, 62% to 38%. We were not, they, they had way more money than we did. They had, they had way more endorsements and things like that. But we understood the district. And so, again, knowledge is power. And, um, and you'll want to, again, you want to know everything about the race and about your district. I, I should have put that in the slide. Uh, but know everything about the district as well, because you might spot an advantage that other people just simply miss. And then you have a wonderful candidate, candidate like Ladon, who's from that area, then it makes it, it makes it a lot easier to take advantage of that. So uh, to your point, not just new seats. I've talked about House District 92, with Tanya, uh, who came in at the same time as Ladon. Uh, they're freshman classmates together. But the on top of that, you want to know um, if you are an existing seat, let's say your seat district doesn't change to her point, let's say the number doesn't change, but the demographics of it change, you want to make sure you understand that as well. There might be a whole new opportunity. Who would have thought that Cobb and Gwinnett would be blue in 2020? Certainly in 2012 and 14, we didn't think that. And now everyone's thinking about running for something in Cobb and Gwinnett. So just keep, a, keep an eye out for that. And, I'm done. I'm going to turn over to Rhonda. Sorry. To get that. <laughs> Absolutely. So, yes, uh, to, to Fred's point, our next speaker who's coming up uh, is Ms. Rhonda Briggins, and she's going to talk about Delta 4, DDNC updates, and give you guys a call to action before we open it up for uh, some Q&A. So, don't forget to put your questions in the box, Mr. Hicks, before Rhonda comes up. Make sure that you share your contact information. You have a request for that um, in the comments. Without further ado, we'll bring up Ms. Rhonda Briggins. Thank you, thank you. Thank you, LaDon. I uh, haven't seen you in a while, so great to see you. Um, my boy Fred, what's up? Um, Helen Butler and everyone, this has been absolutely amazing. I was sitting here thinking like, dang, we should take this um, show on the road. Um, this, was, this has been amazing. Um, Belinda, you did an awesome job. Um, before I get started, if you all could go ahead and tee up my PowerPoint. Um, I want to thank Stone Mountain um, Alumni Chapter and my chapter, Decatur Alumni Chapter, for this opportunity. Sora Sheila Mason, Betty Davis, um, Deborah McLeod, which is who's our technology person, but Deborah is also the state social action coordinator. And all of you, we've had about 75, 80 people on this call tonight. Um, I'm here to talk about D4 Women in Action. So what is D4 Women in Action? It is a 501c4 organization that was established by Delta Sigma Theta to basically take our political um, leg and arm and social action to a whole nother level. And so one of the biggest things that, that I've gotten over the years, and mind you, I have been um, so state coordinator for social action for Georgia. I was regional um, social action coordinator for the Southern region. And now I'm national co-chair um, for social action nationally. And so I have seen this space in Delta from every lens. And in this, one of the biggest complaints we get in social action, 
the biggest complaints we get in social action. Why can't we help our sorors when they run for elected office? Why you tell us to run and then we have no support? What's going on? And so as we were looking at how do we take social action to the next level? How do we truly engage and create pipelines and understand our power? We established D4 Women in Action for that space. Next slide. So it's our legacy. Next slide. So what is that legacy? You know, um, last year was the celebration of the 19th Amendment, 100 years of looking at the right for women to vote. And so many years they've talked about, you know, always, we were founded in 1913, only a few days after we were established, we participated in the Women's Suffrage March. And here, as you see in the Washington Times, they actually talk about Delta Sigma Theta in the newspaper that we were the only collegiate organization, uh, black collegiate organization that participated. The other little nugget I wanna give you all, this is completely a sidebar. You know, all these years we've been talking about the Deltas marching in the back and how that was, blah, 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 blah. Well, you know what? After some extensive research and talking to a whole bunch of folks um, last year when we look really looking in depth at our um, history, we actually didn't march in the back of the parade. We actually marched with the collegiates. And so that is a whole different way of us looking at all of this in our position of power because the white women didn't want us at the parade and they definitely didn't want us marching with the collegiates. They told us to go to the back and we said, no, we're gonna go and march with the collegiates. So we have been in this place of understanding our position and our power from the very beginning the very beginning. Next slide. So this is the board of directors. Um, Siobhan Arline Bradley is our president and co-chair. I'm the secretary and treasurer. Um, Dr. Um, Beverly Scott, uh, Lord, Beverly Smith, um, our national president and CEO um, is a board member. Um, our um, 16th past national president, Thelma Daly is on the board. Our um, national second vice president, Diamond Compton's on the board. And also we have um, Derek Johnson, who's the current president of the NAACP. Um, there's some more board seats, um, opportunities that are open um, for D4 Women um, board. And so we can talk about that a little later um, if you're interested, because we've been recruiting um, board members. Um, D4 Women is, is currently still in its infancy stages, but we've done a lot to, to lift this organization up and put it in a place where it needs to be. Next slide. Our past, you know, we, we, we have our future to guide us, uh, our past to guide us to our future. Um, we stand on the shoulders, as you all know, of giants, of giants. And so the, uh, the other thing with D4 Women, you know, uh, Congresswoman Shirley Chisholm, who also was one of the first candidates for the President of the United States, and the shoulders in which um, our vice president currently, Kamala Harris, often say was her mentor and the person that guided her into this place. And she often said, if they don't give you a seat at the table, bring a folding chair. And so that's what we have to do in this country. And then our other soror, Representative Barbara Jordan, um, what the people want is very simple. They want an America as good as its promise. And it's simple. It is very simple about what we want. We want to seat at the table and we want America to stand up and be what it claimed it was created to be. And that's why we need D4 and folks like you at these tables of power so that we can get to that American promise that was originally thought of in the beginning. Next slide. Our vision, next slide. So, our vision of YC4. Now, currently, right now, Delta Sigma Theta as an organization is a C7 tax exempt. So we needed a firewall. So that's why we always said, you know, Crips and Cream fundraiser. Don't say that you're a Delta. Don't say Sara. You know, you're individual coming to this because we need to have a firewall to protect at all measures our C7, which is our tax exempt status. So as Delta, we as a um, sorority, and we're the only one, we have a 501c7, we have a 501c3, and we also now have a 501c4. And so we have a broad 
base of organizations in our, what I call our arsenal, our toolkit to maneuver and do various things in the community to get us to a place of power. And that is very powerful because no other organization has a lineup in that way. Now, you will see coming behind us, the Omegas have, have filed for their C4 and the other members of the Divine Nine are also filing for C4s and they already have the three. So they're coming behind us, but as always, Delta will always lead the way. Um, so we want to, we have a few things we want to do. We want to identify and prepare African-American women to run for office. We want to make sure we identify critical issues. As always, we want to increase our advocacy, our education, and all of that for the political process. And so that's what we're doing with this space for D4 women. And so we want to make sure that African-American women are screened and qualified, ready, willing, and able to lead. Screen, qualified ready, willing, and able. And so that's what we have to do. We got to find some candidates that understand the position that they're in, understand their power, understand how to utilize that power so we can get to the change we need in this country. Next slide. So um, what is the difference between a four and a seven? The four basically allow us to do partisan politics. Whereas before we always have to say, we're nonpartisan, we're nonpartisan. And you know, y'all still have all Democratic folks and then you mentioned a few Republicans. You know how you do. So now with the, 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 the four, we can be partisan. We can say, we're only going to talk to Democrats. We're only going to talk to Republicans. We're only gonna to talk to independents and it is okay for us to do it. We can directly endorse candidates. We can directly provide resources to them. Now we can't give those resources directly to the candidate in that way, but we can provide um, indirect resources and help them get out the vote and those types of things. It also allows us to sign on to pledges and say we're for certain issues. It allows us to um, make sure we're looking at folks' track record and hold them accountable in a much different way. It allows us to rent lists of, of other candidates' information. It's going to give us some power in a whole different realm than we've had before. Next slide. So I know you all cannot see this, but this is what we just wanted to show, like a cross comparison, where you'll see the roles of a three, the roles of a seven and the roles of a four, what you can and cannot do so that you'll make sure that people are very clear on how money could go between the different organizations. You know, for instance, a, a um, 501c3, um, well, 501c4 can't give to a three and a three um, can't give to a four. And so there are different things that you have to do to make sure you understand how to leverage the resources between these three organizations. And so that's what this slide represents. Next slide. So these are our four pillars. We have four critical pillars for D4. We want to advocate and educate on public policies. We want to develop the Chisholm Jordan Institute to train African American women to run for office and also appointments. Remember, we've been talking about running all night, and I think Belinda talked about appointments. Appointments are very, also very critical. And we want to really do that in the spirit of Delta, because we want to make this, create this pipeline for Delta membership. And we, we've been talking about expanding that later, but we're going to start with Delta, and, and as, as Fred said, we'll take our time and we're going to grow. Uh, we want to encourage our network to donate um, and, and have resources available for these women candidates. We have to have the resources. And then finally, we want to lobby. We want to, we want to talk about what legislation we're for, what legislation we're against. And we also want to talk about how we support or oppose ballot measures. We haven't had a chance to this point as Delta to clearly say non-apologetically that we are for Democrats if we want to be, we're for Republicans if we want to be, we support HR1, we support HR2, but in going to the, uh, these general assemblies and even to the US Congress and really lobby for issues, and which is a little different than being, been, been advocating for those issues, where we are actually in the mix of the development of that, that legislation in a much different way. So again, we're trying to garner more power and influence around this country. Next slide. So let me say this really quickly. 
Um, Belinda talked and got on here and talked about Rose Pack, that Rose Pack is a pack. And D4 Women in Action is not a pack. We are 501c4, we're not a pack. And, and a PAC is a political action committee. It is a 527 organization that pool contributions and money and donations together, either for or against ballots and all of that type of stuff. So they're really into the money pieces. And so we are not a PAC. Now, we are, we are going to hopefully be working very closely with a lot of PACs in addition to the work that we're going to be doing with um, hopefully raising money and really enhancing the work that we do. So this also would have in a, a four will line, allow us to line up a little differently with PACs. Next slide. So really quickly, um, the, the thing that we want to just say here that with a 501c7 versus the four, we're not changing anything that Delta will do um, current, that is currently doing in social action. Nothing changes, nothing changes. Everything that you're doing in your chapters when it comes to social action on the national, regional, local le level, all of that will continue to be the same. All that the seven will do is enhance all of our work that we do and allow us to engage in politics in a much different way, where in the past we have been prohibited to doing a lot of things, it lifts that prohibition against us. Next slide. Our future. Next slide. So we did our announcement. So we hired a firm to go in and make this huge announcement for us. I know you all saw it. We did social media. Um, we had um, Sora Smith and papers and all of those different things. And this is a quote from our national president that basically says that it is her vision. It is her vision to, to make sure that we're going to be at tables everywhere. It is her vision that we will continue the legacy of our founders. It is her vision that we will honor and be open to that legacy that we've had in the past and, and that it will move us forward uh, when you talk about social action and our influence in this country. Next slide. And so we wrote, after we announced um, the organization, we came out the box hard. We did our first round of endorsements. And yes, Georgia, you all showed up, you showed out, and we elected <laughs> U.S. Senator John Ossoff and um, Raphael Warnock. We endorsed them from D for Women. We endorsed the Byron um, Harris ticket. We endorsed members of Congress this year. And so what we've been doing in the space of endorsements, um, right now with D for Women, we have clear criteria of how we do our endorsements. Um, there's queer, um, clear criteria on who we will endorse. Right now, we've been looking at more of a national federal um, lens, um, looking at endorsements for um, mayoral race and, and, and gubernatorial races that um, from big cities. And so we have not gotten into the level in which as a chapter would be concerned with, which is more of your local state uh, municipal type of endorsements. D for women, are, we're just not at the point where we're going to be able to do that. That's why these type of partnerships between D4 and local communities really work because we all can work together. And so we, we, can, we can talk more about how we work together. Next slide. Um, one of the first events we had, we had our inaugural toast um, where we um, celebrated Black women. Um, a lot of the Black women from Georgia were celebrated. I saw Helen Butler, who's on this call tonight, was celebrated that night. Uh, first virtual fundraiser. It was so much fun. We had Joyce Beatty and so many others came. Um, we uh, partnered with Isaiah Thomas, who has a champagne company. And D. Dawkins Hagler, I sent you that bottle of champagne from this fundraiser. I know you just got it, but I sent it to you. So <laughs> she put on Facebook, who sent me this? I did. And so that was from our first fundraiser that we had. We wanted to make sure that um, we partner and people understood what we were trying to do. It was our way of trying to celebrate and make it special for everyone. And so we raised about $25,000. So thank you for everyone that participated in the fundraiser. Look, um, the, um, in the future, we're gonna have much more partnerships and, and other things. So um, next slide. 
our programs. Um, right now we have a list of, of different programs we want to launch. However, our very first program would be the Chisholm Jordan Institute. It is our goal, again, to make sure we have decision makers at every table of government. And so we need Deltas to run for elected office. And so that's what we want. That's what we need to do. And we are just ready to go and trying to launch our Chisholm Jordan Institute. So stay tuned because it will also be a program where you can come and receive some training to um, how to run for elected office. Next slide. And so what does all this stuff mean for you? How do you get involved? And so D for Women, it is an entire separate organization from Delta. Delta created the organization just like we created DREF, but it is a separate organization. It has its own board of directors. And so with this organization, um, you as an individual, no different than you join NCNW, NAACP, you become a supporter of this particular um, organization. So it's not a membership organization. It is more of you supporting the organization, supporting the mission, the goal, the programs. Um, these, if you go to the website, we have different levels of supporters that where you can come in. We can, um, as a supporter, you can volunteer, lend your time and your talent and serve in the way so we can launch these programs and get these women into office. Next slide. We have products. So um, you can go and get you a D4 Women hoodie or t-shirt. At the bottom is the website and where you need to go um, to get those items. And so it is um, www.deltaforwomeninaction.org. You can there also become a supporter. Please go out, buy products, become a supporter. Um, we're looking for um, annual supporters every year on how you can do all of that. And so next slide. And by the way, these shirts are, um, I need that tea. Um, I saw a, a young card design these shirts and her company is actually partners with D4 Women. And so um, she actually handles all of our products for us. And so thank you, um, Sora Card, for everything that you do, who's a member of the Stone Mountain Lithonia chapter. Um, and so we appreciate you for everything that you do. Next slide. If you all have any questions, please let me know. Um, again, D for Women is for us to build our capacity. D for Women is for us to um, elevate everything that we're doing on a national level. Our brand is strong now in Delta. Everyone understand the women in red. They understand what that means. They understand that power. And this is another tool in the toolkit to make us even stronger around the country. But more importantly, this tool in this toolkit is gonna get you at the decision-making table so we can increase our power. All right. So now they want uh, me to give you all the charge. And so um, that's what I'm gonna do. I'm gonna give you the charge really quickly because I think, I don't really think you even need a charge for tonight. This information that you had was absolutely amazing and incredible. And so, um, as I've said before, Soros Charles Chisholm said, if you don't have a seat at the table, bring a folding chair. And we have an opportunity here in Georgia to truly turn Georgia blue. As you see, we need all of the parts to connect uh, for this table of power. You had um, Sora Helen Butler talk to you um, in her organization, all the work she do, I just wanna thank her publicly right now. She is about the voter mobilization and GOTV efforts, everything's elections. So you need her to, to continue that work and stay in that lane and as an organization and for us to continue to support and partner with her. Um, Rose Pack, we talked about the power of the purse. Belinda saying, she kept saying, I'm about the money. I'm about the money. I'm about the money because that is what Rose Pack is. And so on the local ground with, with, with all of the work that we do, you have women and women who wear red um, that have come together to make sure that other women in red have a way to have some money in their coffers to run for elected office. 
And so we need to have those organizations. So if other organizations come up and pop up, there are supplements to all of this. Cause, so we don't have to compete. We need all of these organizations because everybody has a different lane. And then the other thing we said was D for women and we vote run lead and all of these other organizations who come in and as usual, where they are training women to run for elected office. Again, no one's in competition. We need all of these organizations because we gotta make sure everybody can win. And then my boy Fred, as usual, he told us what it takes to win. Okay, and he talked about knowing your community, knowing your numbers, um, understanding how all of these organizations work, understand about how everything comes together, start slow and build big. But more importantly, he said, run girl, run. We need you to run for education. We need to run for health care. We need to run for transportation, voting rights, food access. You know, COVID has shown us the lack of access that we have in this country. And more importantly, we need to run, girl, run for justice. We need to make sure that women are being asked because unlike men, where they just wake up one morning and say, I'm going to be president of the United States and go on and run, they're not thinking about their education. They're not thinking about their experience. They're not thinking about nothing. They just run. But for whatever reason, as the statistics say, women must be asked. And so we've asked you several times tonight to run, girl, run. And I'm going to ask you for a last time. Run, girl, run. And we need to run to truly turn Georgia blue because we need you to save us. We need to move forward in Georgia. I don't know about you. I'm so tired of Georgia being on everybody's mind. I'm so tired of seeing Georgia on the news for negativity. I'm so tired of Georgia being on the news for voter suppression, for the death of Ahmaud Aubrey, for all the foolishness we had during the elections, for we had to launch a whole campaign of, of, of stand, I stand with Keisha. And we had to stand with Keisha because the governor wanted to be against Keisha. So we need to make sure that if we are going to change everything that's going on in Georgia, we got to run, girl, run. We have to run, girl, run. We have to run, girl, run. So I want to thank you, the planning committee. I want to thank you for everyone that participated tonight. This was absolutely amazing. And we need you to run, and I'm gonna thank you in advance. I'm going to thank you in advance for letting Jesus use you for your purpose and changing this world and for you running in Georgia and saving the next generation. I love you and I appreciate everything that you do, everyone involved tonight. And finally, one last time, run girl, run. All right, that was oh a that. That is so powerful. Thank you so much for that final charge to make sure that everybody knows what they should be getting out of this today. You have been armed with all of the information you need to start making that decision to just jump in and run, girl, run. And I'm so excited to have been a part of this of this panel. So um, I think at this point in the uh, program, we're actually supposed to go over questions and answers, but we the Presentations were so great that all of the there were no questions in the chat box, um, and all the questions have or were answered. I think there was one question about what is the municipal uh, races, and that was answered in the chat. We're talking about mayor, city council, things of that sort. So we don't have a whole lot of questions to go over. So I want to um, allow. Um, uh, uh, Rhonda to come back up here and start with the surveys and gifts. But before she begins, um, I want to make sure that I put a shout out for Politicoach. That is my company. I'm a partner with Myesha Goods. Um, and you can find us at politicoach.com. And so everything that Rhonda talked about, everything that Fred talked about, what Politicoach does is one on one training. So if you're here and you're like, hey, I really want to run, but I don't know where to start, I don't know what to do next, we do one on one personal coaching to get you step by step. And so when you get to that point that Fred talked about where you are qualifying to run for office, um, you are able to already have all your stuff set up. You've talked to who your consultants are going to be. You know what you're, what you're running for. You've done your background search and we get you through that step by step. So I would love for you guys to come talk to Politic Coach, see if we are a fit for you so that you can run, girl, run. 
seriously. And so with that, since we don't have any other questions uh, here in the, oh, let's see, I, I do see a question. So let me answer that before we move on. Do we know when redistricting will be finished for state offices? So as Fred mentioned, there is going to be a special legislative session this summer. And during that legislative session, they will sit down and go through some of the redistricting processes um, and vote. They're going to have uh, sessions for the community and public to come out and to give comments on what should be changed. So pay attention, contact your local legislator to find out more information. Go to the Georgia legislative website, which is uh, ga.legs.gov ga.legs.gov and find out about that whole redistricting process as well as the appointments and the meetings and things that they will have related to that. That's definitely something to get uh, involved with. Thank you to Wanda for a shout out for Politicoach. Um, and so Rhonda, I am going to turn it back over to you. I've been promising these ladies some gifts and some other door prizes. So I'm going to let you handle that and get it out to everyone. She, who does it go to? Not me. I handle the gift. <laughs> it comes to Sheila. <laughs> All right, Sheila, take it away. Unless Rhonda has some gifts I'm unaware of. Next slide, uh -huh. please. <laughs> okay. Thank you all so much for being a part of this. So one way we want to thank you beyond getting all the great information that you have, and I understand that there will be a link after um, this presentation so that you can see this information slides because it was so much information and we're so happy that you all came. So we want to give you some gifts. So first there's going to be a survey. So for those who have the QR reader, you can go ahead and, and get the code, or if you need to go on the website, you can do it that way. Open up that survey, complete the survey. There is gonna be a question in there about, are you seriously planning on running for office? If you are, please make sure you put your information, your contact information somewhere on that survey, because we're going to give away four gifts based on who's deciding to run for office. So if you can go to the next slide. And those gifts are gonna be donated by many of our speakers. So I, uh, LaDawn just spoke about hers. So she's gonna give a session. Um, we also have a one from Kimberlyn Carter, Train, Run, Win, Rep George Institute. Um, Belinda's gonna be giving one from Rose Pack and Mr. Hicks is gonna be giving one from HBC LLCs. I mean, excuse me, HEB. LLC. So can make sure you complete that survey. And after this, we will um, do a drawing and we will let you know who gets those choices. So make sure you put your information on the survey. Now we do want to give away some gifts for people who are on the call. And what we created was a wheel of fortune. So if we can upload our wheel of fortune. And so this is everybody that got on the call. We have a, li a list of your names. Hopefully you're still on the call. You have to be present to win. Okay, I need to be able to share my screen. Yes, or Larry. So we will spin okay. the wheel. Are we good? There it is. So we will spin the wheel. We'll call your name. You highlight to let us know you're here. And then in the private area, you can give me your contact information so that we can get your gift certificate to you. Mm. The first winner is. It didn't, um, it didn't choose anybody. It kept, it keeps landing on empty. <laughs> so. Has been detected near your location. Oh, really? Let me see. Oh, okay. There you go. Sharon Walker. So Sharon, Sharon Walker, is she available? 
if you're if you're on, you need to let us know that you're here. Otherwise, we're going to move on. All right. Looks like she's not here. We're going to go to the next one. Technology, if you can let us know if they raise their hand. Rhonda Briggins. <laughs> All right. <laughs> okay. Yeah, I'm here. Where my prize? I'm here. <laughs> you earned it. She's here. <laughs> All right. Great. Carol Taylor. Carol Taylor. Ali. Is she present? No? Oh. Okay, we'll, right. keep, we'll keep it moving. <laughs> keep it moving. And then they come by now. I'm so successful. Marilyn Diggs. Marilyn Diggs. No, she's not locked in. Okay. Hi, it's Marilyn. Oh, oh hi. It's Marilyn. Marilyn. <laughs> hi. Awesome. All right. All right, Marilyn. Okay. You got to win. <laughs> Two more. <laughs> Isola Porter. <laughs> All right. This is Congratulations, Azola. Azola, unmute yourself. She's not here. Okay, moving on. Anita Cummings. Anita Cummings. Unmute yourself if you're here. Okay, just moving right along. <laughs> Leslie Walker. Leslie Walker. I saw her earlier. I'm here. Ding, 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 ding. Okay, good. Oh, All, right. All right. One more. Charlene Pruitt. I saw her. She's here somewhere. Charlene, unmute yourself. I'm here. Yeah. I know you're here. <laughs> All right, great. <laughs> All right, that's All right, it. Thank Congratulations. you so much. So again, I want to uh, thank everyone for participating. And so for the people who won, if you can go into the private area of the chat and give me your contact information and everybody else, make sure you complete the survey and put your contact information on there. Otherwise, we can't send you your one-on-one -on -one session if you are chosen. Next slide. Okay, I guess I'm going to stop sharing. All right, so special thanks to uh, Stone Mount Lithonia and Decatur alumni, the committees that put this together, really appreciate the hard work everyone has done. Next slide. And now for closing remarks, we'll have our remarks from uh, President Adrian Wright Jackson from Decatur alumni. Thank you so much. Good evening, good evening, good evening. What an amazing program. 
I am Adrienne Jackson, president of the Decatur Alumni Chapter of Delta Sigma Theta Sorority Incorporated. And on behalf of the more than 500 members of our chapter, I wanna thank you for joining us this evening to learn more about what it takes to run for office. Run, girl, run. Our sorority's national president, Sora Beverly Evans Smith, has challenged our members to get more involved in the political process at every level of government. And so it was very exciting to see that you all have taken the first step towards getting your names on one of our next ballots. I do want to extend a special thanks for our energetic, enthusiastic, as well as esteemed panelists. Sora Rhonda Briggins of the Decatur Alumni Chapter. Sora Helen Butler of the Decatur Alumni Chapter. Uh, Mr. Frederick Hicks, amazing, amazing. Sora Belinda Pedroso of the Decatur Alumni Chapter and our dynamic moderator, LaDawn Jones. Thank each of you for your helpful insights, tips, and knowledge that you shared this evening, and they've all been invaluable. While it is a daunting task to run for office, we know that you've started um, everyone on the path to not only run for office, but to also get that important win. So we don't wanna just run for office, we wanna win. I'd finally also like to acknowledge the hardworking source of the social action committees for both the Decatur alumni and Stone Mountain Lithonia alumni chapters. I know that you all have worked diligently to not only produce programs like these, but also on voter registration, education and mobilization initiatives. So thank you for everything that you do to make every citizen of DeKalb more politically aware and engaged. And I said finally a second ago, but this is really finally. A special thanks again for each of you uh, for this May week activity that was co-hosted co by Stone Mountain Lithonia and the Decatur Alumni Chapters. We also encourage you to follow both chapters, social media accounts, uh, accounts so that you can participate in other activities during the remainder of the week. Hashtag DST, DAC, and hashtag SMLAC DST. And so I will now close and say, run, girl, run. Thank you so much. Awesome. Thank you. Thank you, um, Sora Jackson. Um, my name is Joy Burtz. I am here on behalf of our president, Danette Battle, with the Stone Mountain Lithonia Alumni Chapter. Thank you so much all for joining us today. Sora Jackson has said it all. I have nothing else left to say at this point, but we appreciate your time this evening. Uh, we thank you for joining us, and we just want to say good night. Have a good night, everyone. Good night. Good night. Thank you. Good night. Thank you, everyone. Amazing. Good night, Sheila. <laughs> Good night.